this, there is no reason for me to even teach physiology anymore if it's all just going to be female nursing students. <laughs> and she gets some testosterone in this room to kind of even some things out and mellow, mellow it down. All right, so we're going to begin um, conversation on vessels, which is another portion of the cardiovascular, or I should say the circulatory system. And we're going to start with some general vessel anatomy. Yeah, did I not finish? I think I finished up the last. Yeah, I finished up the, that heart anatomy and physiology, and so now we're going to talk about the vessels. The heart pumps the blood, the vessels carry the blood. Uh, so when we look at the vessels that move blood around the human body, we can classify them into three different types. So three types of vessels. And you can see in this figure here the three general classes or types of vessels. And these are going to be arteries. And these are going to be the vessels that carry blood away from the heart. Okay, so notice that I'm saying these are the vessels that carry blood away from the heart and there's no reference to oxygen. It's possible that when you were in a biology or an anatomy class in high school or previously that you were told that arteries carry oxygenated blood and that veins carry deoxygenated blood, and that's a lie. That's actually not really true. And the reason that is is because of the arteries that lead out to the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary artery is carrying deoxygenated blood, but it's an artery. So it's not carrying oxygenated blood. So really, arteries, by definition, are the vessels that carry blood away from the heart. It has nothing to do with whether or not it's oxygenated or not oxygenated. Arteries are eventually going to lead to capillaries. And by the way, I guess before I move on here, there are going to be different sizes and types of arteries, just the same as there's different sizes and types of veins as well. And we're going to come back and we're going to hit on those. But in general terms, blood is carried away from the heart by the arteries, and the capillaries are going to carry blood through the tissue. Carry blood through the tissue. And then it's going to empty, the capillaries will empty into our third type of vessel, which are the veins. And veins are going to carry blood back to the heart. Okay, so arteries carry blood away, capillaries carry blood through the tissue, and veins carry blood back to the heart. Again, no reference to oxygenation of the blood. Now, our vessels have some pretty unique histology. And really, the vessels, not only do they conduct or move blood throughout the body, but they're also going to have to allow, in some uh, uh, areas of the circulation, particularly the capillaries, exchange of nutrients and gases and pickup of waste products. We're also going to have to deal with large changes in pressure. And so the histology of arteries and veins is such that these different uh, functions can be adhered. Now, really, we can look at arteries and veins, and there's going to be very similar histology, very similar tissue makeup for these two types of vessels. In fact, both of these have three layers of tissue that are referred to as tunica. So three layers in each of these arteries and veins called the tunica. And these tunica are going to be referred to by their position. So 
So tunica interna is going to be the most the innermost layer. The tunica media will be the middle layer. And then tunica externa will be our outer layer. So we have three different layers, and you can actually see in this picture you have tunica interna, tunica media, and then tunica externa, also sometimes referred to as the tunica adventia. And the composition of these three different layers of vessels, the histology, is going to be varied based off of the size and the type of the vessel. So composition of the layers of the tunica is going to differ by size and type. Okay, so let's start with our arteries. The arteries are divided further into a variety of different names based off of primarily size. Uh, and the first, the biggest of the arteries are known as conductive arteries. So these are very large. And they're very elastic. And this makes a lot of sense because these are actually going to be located in parts of the circulation that deal with large amounts of pressure. The aorta is an example of a conducting artery. It's very large and it's elastic because it has to expand to accommodate those large pressures that are being used to move blood from the left ventricle out into the general circulation. In addition, because it is elastic and it expands uh, to contain that uh, large volume of blood that gets spit out, that 70 milliliters of blood, then when the left ventricle is not contracting, which is about 50% of a heartbeat, about half a second, that recoil of that elastic tissue helps to maintain a heightened level of pressure, kind of a second pumping of the, of the heart, if you will, based off of the, uh, the large aorta. And that's what I'm showing here is sort of that you got flow out of the left ventricle that allows the, the vessel, the artery, the aorta to expand under that pressure. And then when the left ventricle is not contracting and that valve is closed, then you have that elastic recoil that helps to maintain a higher level of pressure, pushing blood through the general circuit. So basically the pressure remains elevated whether the left ventricle is currently contracting or it's not currently contracting. So is that elasticity what we were measuring in our lab on Thursday? So is that elasticity what you were measuring in lab on Thursday? Like the, I don't remember what lab you did on Thursday. Were you looking at? We were looking at the stiffness of our like, Yeah. No, you weren't measuring that. What you were measuring is the reflection. So when, every time your heart beats and it pushes a bolus of blood out into the circulation, it sends a pulse wave out. And that pulse wave, it's kind of like taking a tennis ball. If I were to throw the tennis ball at that wall with the windows, and let's say that one of the windows was open and I threw it just so that it went right through the window, it would never bounce back. And that's because there's nothing for it to bounce back on. If we also had a dorm mattress and I threw the ball at it, threw the ball at the dorm mattress, it would hit that mattress and it would bounce back, but it would only bounce back a very short, short distance because that dorm mattress would absorb a lot of that force. Okay? Now, 
let's say that I take the same ball and I throw it and I hit the wall or I hit the window itself. Now it's probably going to bounce back a lot because the, the, the material is a lot harder. So what you are looking at is how hard, how stiff the arteries were. The more bounce back that you get in that false contour wave that was created, the more uh, stiffness it's going to be present in um, basically below where you were measuring, which was going to be in the in the arm. So that pulse wave comes out, and it, 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 it's going to hit the vessel wall. And if you have hardening of the arteries, which is called atrial sclerosis, it would bounce back pretty pronounced. Most of you shouldn't have that. You should have very uh, soft, so to speak, uh, flexible elastic vessels. And so a lot of it should have been absorbed. Very little of it should have been transmitted back up towards the heart. So that's actually what you're measuring in that lab, not necessarily this elastic recoil of the aorta. Okay, our conducting arteries are going to lead into what are called distributing arteries. And these distributing arteries are going to be medium in size. So they're going to be less, uh, less diameter, arterial diameter, than our large conducting arteries. And they're also going to be muscular. And these muscular arteries are going to help to basically accommodate higher pressure. So we're distributing blood to smaller and smaller regions of the circulation. And the muscle that's, that's contained in there, which is going to be in the muscularis of the um, uh, uh, tunic media, tunica media, and it's going to help to basically control the, the size of the vessel. Because if I just don't, if I didn't have that muscle layer and I had a bunch of blood that flowed into that vessel, it would just balloon up and it would increase in volume. What would happen to pressure? Pressure would drop, and if I drop pressure, I'm reducing the ability for blood to be circulated throughout the whole tissue. So having that muscle there helps to maintain the diameter of the tube so that we can regulate the pressure so that it's optimal for optimal blood flow. And that's coming from that muscle tissue as we distribute blood through the distributing arteries into our uh, basically what we would call local circulation. All right, so um, from the distributing arteries, we go a little bit smaller. And these are referred to as the resistance arteries. These are going to be small. Sometimes these are also referred to as arterioles. And this is basically the entrance into our capillary beds. Okay, so these are small arteries that lead into the capillary beds. Sometimes there are going to be met arterioles, and these met arterioles are going to be arterioles that link the arteries into the capillaries. Actually, I think I sort of had a picture of this if I didn't want to do that. There we go. Let's take a step back here. So you have your arterial that's basically leading away from those distributing vessels. Okay, so the distributing arteries. Everything okay? The distributing arteries are leading into the arterioles and then wherever we go off into an individual capillary bed so here's one capillary bed here's a second capillary bed you can see that we have this met arterial that leads into into the capillary bed okay so these are our resistance arteries 
resistance arteries that bring blood into the capillaries. Now, one of the reasons they're called resistant arteries is because they interact or they have these smooth muscle rings that are called sphincters. And these reduce and restrict or resist blood flow into the capillary or allow large amounts of blood flow into the capillary. So when do we want blood flow in a capillary bed? All the time or only when we need it? Well, we really only want it when we need it. We want it when our muscles are working. What is going on back there? Oh my gosh. All right, so these arterioles and met arterioles lead into the capillary beds and they uh, associate with these things called precapillary sphincters. And the precapillary sphincters are going to encircle the entrance to a capillary bed. Now, by having these precapillary sphincters in place, what we're able to do is we can regulate blood flow at the local level. So we can reduce or even shunt our blood flow and, and move blood away from the areas where we don't need it and into the areas where we do need it. So let's say I go off for a run. When I'm running, I want to supply blood into my muscles, the working tissue. And so the precapillary sphincters will open up to accommodate that blood flow into those tissues. I don't really want to spend time digesting food or producing urine. So I'm going to shunt blood away from my digestive system. I'm going to shunt blood away from the kidneys. Because I just don't, that's not really productive. If I'm running, I want to use the muscle. I don't really want to use the tissue to generate a large amount of urine. Yes? So is that why, like, pretty run, you can just, like, go to the bathroom, and then you start running all the spots, but you don't feel the urgent ones? Well, part of it is that. Part of it is also that the urge to urinate is not a circulatory system function. The urge to urinate is a nervous system func function. And exercise moves you from being parasympathetic towards sympathetic. And a sympathetic response is basically to prepare you to run away. If you have to urinate, it's probably not very um, conducive for your running away. Right? On the converse, though, <laughs> um, the initial flight or flight actually it decreases digestion, but it increases, um, how shall I put this nicely? I don't think there's any way to put this nicely. It increases the likelihood of a bowel movement, which for us is probably not really all that. I mean, if you're being chased by a bear, it may actually not be that bad of an idea to drop a little packet off that the bear's going to stop and sniff and be like, what is this? Because it's going to give you an opportunity to run away. But in the wild, under those stressful situations, defecating actually is, is highly advantageous because it reduces the likelihood the animal will continue pursuit because they're going to be like, whoa. What's this? <laughs> I'm going to smell this. <laughs> um, so because humans really don't necessarily do that, although sometimes it does happen, they recommend that if you have a bear that's chasing you or some other wild animal that can kill you, that if you're wearing a backpack, you should just drop your backpack. And it'll cause the, the animal to stop. And it's playing off of that natural mechanism to cause defecation at the point of frightening. Have you ever like had a, a mouse or a hamster or anything like as a little pet and you went into your room and like scared it? <laughs> <laughs> it drops off a couple little packets and goes and hides in the corner. I don't know, maybe you haven't seen that before. How did we go from capillary blood flow to <laughs> All right, thank you Meredith for that.
that rabbit hole tangent on uh, defecation, which we will be coming back to defecation when we talk about digestion, just to kind of foreshadow a little bit. Okay, so we can control where blood goes uh, based off of need, based off of the needs of the organism. In our arterial system, we also have sensing organs, and these are specialized tissues that interact with the nervous system. It's basically an extension of the nervous system that is found in the arteries, found in the tissue that makes up the arteries. And there are actually a couple different types of these sensing organs. And I do have some pictures here. So this is the aorta leading away from the left ventricle. And these little yellow dots here are supposed to basically represent groups of cells that we find in the walls of uh, the aortic arch and up here in um, the right and left internal carotid arteries. Okay, so these are sensing organs. You can see that these actually go back to some cranial nerves. Um, cranial nerve 9 and cranial nerve number 10 and help to bring information into the brain which helps us to regulate the condition, both blood and chemical condition, the pressure, I should say, both the pressure and chemical condition of the blood. Okay, so um, one of these sensors or one type of sensor are called ferroreceptors. And just based off of the name, you probably have already guessed that the baroreceptors are going to respond to pressure changes. Now, I am sure that you are all very aware that high pressure in the bloodstream, high blood pressure, is very problematic. In fact, it leads to um, what they refer to as the widowmaker, which is aneurysms. So we want to help to regulate, or we want to regulate our blood pressure, and we want to keep it right around about 110 to 120 over 107 or over 70 to, to 80. Okay, systolic and diastolic pressures. So if we have changes in pressure, we want to have some sort of counteractive mechanism that will bring that pressure down. On the converse, if we have a massive drop in pressure. If we have a uh, reduction in pressure, we can see a reduction in blood flow, which would be problematic as well, so we would respond by increasing blood pressure. So we're just simply going to try to regulate pressure. We're going to monitor that pressure with baroreceptors, and we're going to respond to those pressure changes, which is going to be initiated immediately by the nervous system, and then we're going to have some long-term hormonal regulation as well. So these baroreceptors are going to be the sensory organs that are going to help to initiate that monitoring process. And these are going to be located in the aorta. Okay, so we have the aortic arch, and those make up the aortic baroreceptors. But then notice that we also have a group of cells located there in the tissue surrounding the carotid arteries. Those are going to be called carotid sinuses. These are another type of baroreceptor. That are just simply located in the internal. So this is the wall of the internal carotid arteries. Both the right and the left internal carotid arteries. And as hopefully you can kind of imagine, these are going to respond to pressure. Pressure is a mechanical stimuli. So a change in pressure, we're probably going to see in these cells, in the cell membrane, mechanically stimulated or mechanically gated ion channels. And as pressure changes, you have more or less of those ion channels forced open or closed, resulting in influx of ions to generate an action potential that gets moved up that cranial nerve. By the way, anyone remember cranial nerve 9? It says number 10 is vagus. What about cranial nerve number 9? Let's 
Starts with a G. Glossal pharyngeal. So the carotid sinuses, basically when you're thinking about this, these are just groups of cells that have a very specific responsibility and can, can respond to those mechanical changes as pressure is pushing against those cells. And it's going to be innervated by glossal pharyngeal. I'm not going to take the time to spell all of that out. So that's a cranial nerve, so the signal get sent signal on the change, the change in pressure that's being picked up by the carotid bodies or the carotid sinuses, signals change in blood pressure, get sent directly to the brain, and then the brain integrates that signal and dictates the response. Now, the really crazy thing, the really neat thing about these signals that get sent back to the brain, we're talking about basically a nerve fiber transmitting an action potential. And that nerve fiber transmitting the action potential is just one of literally millions of nerve fibers from all over the body sending signals back into the brain. And so the brain has to be able to determine one, where is the signal coming from? Two, what is the signal representing? And three, where do I need to send a dictating response out to, to, cause, to cause some sort of change? So there's a ton of information that has to be held. And what we're beginning to understand is that there are going to be patterns in the frequency of action potentials being sent to the brain by, um, the, by these different sensory organs. And that's what's being re represented here. You can see that the number of action potentials under normal pressure readings, 110 over 70, you get sort of this barcode of action potentials. This holds enough information for the brain to recognize where the information is coming from, what the information is, is actually uh, in reference to, that it's blood pressure, and what it needs to do or helps to de de determine what needs to happen. When blood pressure increases and we have to counteract that, so we basically want to um, have a downstream effect of reducing blood pressure, the barcode changes. The frequency of action potentials actually changes and this new barcode carries information, still says where is it coming from, what is it measuring, what needs to happen. <laughs> Same thing happens with decrease in blood pressure. We change the uh, frequency there, change the barcode being sent back to the brain, and again, the brain can pick up on that information and determine what, what needs to happen. Now, don't really let this pass you by without really understanding this is logical sequencing. This is the same thing, thing, same thing a computer does, except for the computer uses zeros and ones. We're using action potentials. This is pretty amazing. In addition, because this is what happens, it makes it possible, and I think we're very soon, in fact, we already are, have some examples of um, artificially made tissues that can be put back into the body and interfaced with the nervous system to give off the correct sequence of action potentials, the frequency of the barcode to be able to help regulate things like blood pressure, or it might be just a whole new arm, a bionic arm that gets reattached to a soldier that lost his arm in battle. And it's because of this. It's because of this logical sequencing that is present that we actually, I think, can, can probably achieve that, which is going to be pretty awesome. OK, um, so those are both dealing with the blood pressure, right? But we also have to maintain the blood chemistry. We also have a grouping of cells that are called the carotid bodies. 
and you can see that sort of represented here in this figure. This is our bifurcation coming off of the common carotid artery. And so you have the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery. And right at that bifurcation, right at the, at the base there, you have this grouping of cells that are known as the carotid bodies. And the carotid bodies are going to be chemoreceptors. And these chemoreceptors, rather than responding to changes in, in pressure, the chemoreceptors are going to respond to the changes observed in chemical composition of the blood. Of chemical composition. Now, uh, if you take a look at this, you're actually going to see that we have two nerves that are uh, that are found here. We're going to have um, cranial nerve nine, which is glossal pharyngeal, and cranial nerve number ten, which is vagus. So both glossal pharyngeal and vagus. Now, what is the main chemical components that we are going to be monitoring with our carotid bodies, these chemoreceptors? The chemical composition of the blood is going to change and so we're going to have changes in things like pH or changes in things like carbon dioxide composition and we want to make sure that we keep pH within our homeostatic limits <coughs> and we want to make sure that we keep carbon dioxide levels in homeostatic limits. And so the result here, if we have, let's say, a decrease in pH, decrease in pH, is that more acidic or more basic? So more acidic. So let's say the blood becomes more acidic. That's going to be picked up by the carotid body. You're going to get a signal sent back to the uh, central nervous system. And this is going to result in changes in breathing. which is actually really interesting. We haven't talked much about the respiratory system just yet, but what we're going to find out is there are chemical reactions that as you get rid of CO2, which is going to increase as you increase breathing, you actually run this chemical reaction where a um, molecule called bicarbonate combines with hydrogen to form carbonic acid that then is converted enzymatically into carbon dioxide and water. And the carbon dioxide gets removed from the system, and we basically run that chemical reaction so that we're producing carbon dioxide. But we're consuming hydrogen on, on the beginning of the reaction, and that hydrogen, as it's removed, increases the pH, brings the pH back up into the normal levels. And that's all centered around those changes in breathing. So whenever you breathe, and stay and change your rate of breathing, it's going to result in stabilization of things like pH. It's going to change how much CO2 is removed and also how much oxygen is brought in. And all of those are chemicals that are being, and chemical characteristics that are being monitored by uh, things like the carotid bodies. All right, one last group of sensory organs. And these are going to be referred to as the aortic bodies. Where do you think these are going to be located? Okay, we're going to find these in the aorta, and we're going to find out that these are ha or that these have the same functions as the carotid bodies. The 
they just happen to be located in the aorta, and specifically, if we're going to be, we're going to find these in the aortic arch. Okay, and it's going to work collectively with the carotid bodies to help maintain our chemical composition of the blood. Okay, so there's our arteries. Help to maintain pressure and the chemical composition of the blood. They also help to distribute blood down to the capillary level. So let's begin with the capillaries. Now, capillaries are going to be considered the exchange vessels. So what exactly does that mean? Well, what it means is nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide and waste products are going to be moved in and out of the bloodstream only in the capillaries. In other words, in our big distributing arteries, we're not going to move oxygen across into the uh, extracellular fluid. We're not going to move carbon dioxide or oxygen across. That's only going to occur in the capillaries because they are the exchange vessels. And really, this is the purpose. This is where the purpose of the vasculature, which is to circulate nutrients, to supply nutrients to the working tissue and to remove the waste products. This is the, the purpose of the vasculature, and it's in the capillaries where this purpose is actually served. Now, the capillaries, we know that arteries and veins, they have three layers. We call them tunica. The tunica are not going to be represented in the capillaries. The capillaries are going to be thin walls. In fact, our capillaries really are just a single layer of cells, a single layer of endothelial cells. So they're thin wall. They are also very small diameter. Thin wall and small diameter. In fact, there are some examples of capillaries that are so small in diameter. These would be our smallest capillaries. They are so small that the red blood cell actually has to deform in order to cross through. Now, you'll remember that the red blood cell, if I kind of draw it up here in cross section, sort of had that discoid shape and the middle of the capillary, I'm sorry, of the red blood cell there was thinner and it allowed the, just like on this piece of paper, I can fold it. It's the, the, the thinner um, portion of the red blood cell allows the, the red blood cell to fold up on itself like that. And the reason that is, is because of these very smallest capillaries. They're so small that in order to get through, the red blood cell has to uh, fold up to pass through that really, really small diameter. There are, and why do we know this? There are certain conditions where the red blood cell takes on more of a sphere shape. One of the conditions is a condition known as hereditary spherocytosis. And individuals with hereditary spherocytosis, those very smallest capillaries, the red blood cells actually get blocked up. And then they burst, and there's a heart, uh, higher rate of uh, hemolysis in those individuals. So with that condition, the, the uh, capillary is so small, so here's a capillary, that the, the red blood cell might not actually really be able to effectively fit in there. It's still, some of them still can get in, but a lot of them are going to get broken apart. We will pick up with this figure on Wednesday. These are the three types of capillaries, and we will talk about those starting on Wednesday. If we get large amounts of snow, I pray that you be safe.
If a ca kayak materializes on campus this year, do not ride it. <laughs> no canoe, no kayak. Also, sliding towards a bunch of big lights and pylons is not a good idea.